The promise of democracy is government that includes everyone. But voter turnout is declining. Public cynicism is increasing. What's responsible for this disconnect? Let's find out. In our nation's capital, two guests tonight, Don Lenahan, he's senior associate at the Public Policy Forum, and Nancy Peckford, executive director of Equal Voice. And with us here in studio, Heather Bastido, Skelton Clark postdoctoral fellow at Queen's University, Desmond Cole, project coordinator at City Vote, and Nahid Mustafa, broadcaster and writer who has explored some of these issues in last November's issue of The Atlantic. And we're glad to have you three here in our studio and our two guests in the nation's capital. We want to remind our viewers that you can be part of our discussion tonight. Our producers are holding a Twitter chat right now, so please chime in using hashtag Agenda TVO and let us know your thoughts. Don, get us started tonight. Uh, would you say that democracy in Ontario in particular, in Canada in general, has become an elitist institution. Well, I think we probably have to put this in a bit of a historical context. Um, after all, a democracy has changed a lot. If we were to go back and look at the beginning, it, I think it's fair to say that democracy was always elite in some ways. Certainly in the early days it was. Aboriginal people and uh, women weren't a part of it to begin with. Uh, there's a second phase, though, that if we look in the post-war period, it's interesting, was we, as governments began to build the welfare state, they began to look on us as having uh, individual responsibility to citizens, and I think that engaged us in a new way. We might be getting into, a, in fact, I would say we are getting into a third phase, and that third, third phase now over the last 30 years or so, uh, we're a lot more educated, we're a lot more aware, we're a lot more involved, uh, and I think it's uh, people have become a much more, their attitudes are changing, much more demanding in two ways in particular. Certainly people want governments to be more accountable and more transparent in a way they did in the past. And maybe the most interesting part is the, the, the sense that they should have a say on things they want to have a say on. Traditionally governments kind of were elected to, government, to govern uh, and people let them govern. Now I think there's a real tension between that and people may feel if they don't get a say that in fact we really are living in a pretty in elite world. Nancy Peckford, how about your view? Is it more elitist today than ever? Well, like Don, I, I would suggest that, in fact, our, our institutions have always been to some degree uh, elitist, and certainly when you look at uh, gender and other underrepresented groups, uh, the reality is is that our institutions were formed well before women and, and many other groups had the right to vote, and still those institutions function in a way that we argue sometimes excludes or discourages uh, those groups from getting involved. And if the face of your institutions doesn't meaningfully reflect those uh, who you purport to represent, then I do think you have considerable challenges. And I would like to note that, you know, obviously we've seen some tremendous success on the part of uh, women over the last 30 to 40 years. But at the same time, we're looking at 25% women on average in political institutions across the country. Only 16% of Canada's mayors are female. And as you know, we went from a historic high of six female premiers to now three, and even uh, that number is in question. So Equal Voice is really out to change the game because we do think our political institutions really haven't caught up with the times. Heather, what do you say? I would say that uh, there is a huge amount of opportunity uh, right now in democracy for engagement for uh, n not necessarily uh, just elite, but the politics has got a lot more com complicated in the last little mm -hmm. while. And just because we have social media and twi Twitter so I can get in touch with you doesn't mean everybody has social media and Twitter. Those skills require a special expertise and that's uh, shutting some of the electorate out of the conversation, which mm -hmm. is a bit dangerous. Uh, I, I hear you, but like most people are on Twitter now, aren't they? Uh, most you people. Tell me. Um, no, I would say more, a lot of Canadians are uh, uh, a lot of Canadians are on Twitter. They're not talking about politics on Twitter, and, and uh, a whole lot of Canadians are not on Twitter. Uh, they don't even have a lot of Canadians don't have uh, computers or access to computers. Cell phones, yes. Access to computers, no. Okay, that's funny because I'll tell you what. I hear from everybody on Twitter, but that's another story. You hear from everybody who's on Twitter. <laughs> yes, no, that's a fair point. <laughs> and, and some days it just feels like it's everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes no, the, the entire country, yeah. Okay, Desmond, where are you coming down on this? Uh, democracy as an elitist institution. I think that um, over time we've been trying to move away from uh, 
power being concentrated in the hands of few and making our democracy open and more accessible. I don't think we're anywhere near there yet. I think we've been moving in that direction. I wouldn't say that we've lost a sense of democracy being for the people and it's become more elitist. I think we've been going in the other direction the whole time. And I think that um, it's, what's troubling is that when you look at something like participation in political parties, you know, it's, I think, 5% in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people in our country don't feel like they belong to the institutions of democracy, that they don't feel like it's for them. They don't feel like someone is inviting them to come and participate. And I, I you know, we live in a consumer culture where people say, what's in it for me? And so I think that if we want people to participate, we have to get used to the idea that they want to know what value they're going to get for their contribution. Nahid, how about you? Well, I think, um, so part of the discussion around um, institutions as being sort of the home of the elites, um, one of the things we don't really talk about is racial and class representation within these institutions. Um, and I think that that is actually, I mean, there's almost no racial and class diversity within these institutions. And so you do see that, um, you know, people are getting pulled into the system, but within their own communities, these are also people who are, um, you know, closer to the elites. And so I, I feel like there's a problem with the structure of the institutions themselves um, and the way that these institutions interact with the population in general, I don't think that we really have um, a democratic sentiment. Um, I think that a lot of people, especially newer Canadians... Sorry, say that again? We well, don't have a democratic sentiment? I don't think we do. I don't think that we feel that these institutions... I think we have this idea that, um, you know, ideally these institutions are there to serve the broad public, um, but we don't act that way. We don't um, act in a way as though, for example, government is for everybody. Government is really hard to access. Um, you know, getting a government job is incredibly difficult. Um, finding your way around a government website. Uh, have you ever tried to interact with, you know, Citizenship and Immigration Canada? I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous labyrinth. And so we have these institutions that we, I think, um, not like to pretend, but I think that we've convinced ourselves that they're very open and transparent, well, but they're not. Let me, well, Don, let, let me get you to follow up on that. Is it not the case in Canada today that if you have, let's say, an issue around immigration, you can make an appointment to see your member of parliament at his or her constituency office at a time of mutual convenience and figure it out? Do we not live in that world anymore? Well, uh, well, I think we do live in that world. The real question is, uh, for most of the problems that people have and the current concerns they have, how much impact is their member likely to have? Indeed, how much impact is their government likely to have? If I can just take a bit of a detour here, Steve, I'd say one thing. If something that has changed over the last 30 years is the way that we think about issues and maybe even the issues themselves. Think about the environment. 30 years ago, we thought it was something that was relatively self-contained. Today, everybody talks about sustainable, environment, uh, sustainable development, which means the environment and the economy are are closely connected. You can't think about one without the other. And I guess what I'd say is as these changes are taking place and we become more aware of how interconnected things are, uh, governments continue to promise us big things like jobs and a better economy and sustainable development. But at the end of the day, we start realizing how complex these things are. And I think there's a lot of doubt and even a lack of trust about government's ability to deliver on the promises it makes. I appreciate that. But Nancy, th th those, are, those are macro issues. That's very okay. sort of big picture stuff. Uh, let's get it a little more down to, um, you know, the, the streets, right. the sidewalks, yeah. the, the stuff, uh, the brass tacks. Is it not the yeah. case that if you've got a problem with something going on in government, you can meet with your MP and discuss it? That's the, the most basic aspect of democracy, is that you can meet your representative and deal with these issues. Doesn't that happen anymore? Oh, certainly, I think it, it does happen, but I, I would agree that I think that people are a little bit detached from their political institutions, and depending on the circles you run in and, and how you understand the political process, um, you're not necessarily inclined uh, to pick up the phone to your MP or your MPP as a first step. But, you know, equal voice is, is actually quite encouraged by the number of women in particular who are actually very, very uh, eager to get engaged in the political process. And what we're trying to do is really think about how do we make sure that those institutions really signal an open door. And, for example, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time contemplating the kind of gotcha politics culture that we're currently in. And really, who does that serve in the kind 
kind of character assassination of those in elected office, and particularly women in elected office? And how do we ensure that those institutions are receptive to not only Canadians in general, but those who are serving in them? And how do we cultivate a culture so that the people who are in those institutions are, are actually portrayed as real human beings who, in fact, are accessible? And for us, that's very important because when we're looking at 25% women's representation and you look at the numbers for visible minority women and Aboriginal Canadians and persons with disabilities and on it goes, you know, the numbers in terms of uh, formal elected uh, representatives are, you know, are, are very low. So we want people to see their elected representatives as uh, representing them and, and reflective of who they are in their lives. And I think our political culture, certainly in, in recent years, hasn't really humanized those who are serving in, in those jobs. And you know, for us, we, we want more women to feel compelled to contribute to those political institutions and be a part of them. No, fair enough. But Heather, it is called the House of Commons. Are, yes. are the people in that house no longer commoners? Uh, I don't know whether they're commoners or not, um, but I, I do want to go back to uh, a point she's made. I just spent a lot of time in writings with yeah. MPs, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of good work that happens there, but there are not a lot of people that know that good, yeah. that's where the connection's made. You know how uh, we look, and, and they hate politicians, but they love their local MP. There's a reason they love their local MP, is that's where the connection's made. And uh, you uh, spent time in, in Muskoka, Perry Sound, with Tony Clement, and he's Tony there. He's not, yes, sir, minister. He's, uh, Tony, I'm having a problem. I need your help. So that they do come to the offices. I would argue that there's not very many people, a lot of people don't know that they can go to the office, that that MP is going to answer their questions. And that's uh, where there's a bit of a disconnect or a broken piece. I'm, I'm guessing part of this disconnect is that media only cover food fights and they don't cover 90% of the work that elected people do and therefore we get the wrong impression of what's going on. Fair to say? Sure, and I, I think that that's, that's a problem in a variety of things. I mean, you know, look at, look at the perception of corruption, for example, right? I mean, you know, there's a, there's a sense that uh, everything is profoundly rotted from the inside and that's because that's what gets reported, mm -hmm. right? And so definitely the, the media coverage sort of feeds that, um, that perception. But, but one of the things I want to say just in regards to um, this whole idea about humanizing our representatives and, and letting people know that, that Tony Clement is Tony uh, to his constituency, that also is representative um, only to a certain demographic. Right, um, you know that that you have to feel like you are entitled to be part of the system in order to feel like you're entitled to be part of the system, and that has to be, I think, reflected back to you in terms of not only who's who's doing the work, but in terms of how those institutions are set up, plus also what your historical memory is of of, of your relationship to government, right? Um, and so, for a lot of people, the idea of just picking up the phone and going to see your MP, that's not realistic for them in their world. Um, is that because and, they may have come from another country where that experience um, would just be impossible? That's part of it, but it, you don't necessarily have to be from another country. I mean, it could be a class issue, it could be a race issue, um, it could be an urban versus rural issue. Um, it, there, there are a variety of factors that feed that perception of whether or not you're a voice that anyone wants to listen to. Hmm. Um, yes. And so, I, you know, the idea that I could, for example, given my background and given my privilege and given where I'm coming from, could feel like I can pick up a phone and say, listen, I have this problem and I need you to answer for it. Um, you know, that's recognizing that I have built up a certain amount of um, cultural capital. And if you don't have that cultural capital, where do you begin to start that interaction? Okay, but Desmond, again, I, I want to come back to this issue. It is called the House of Commons. It's not called the House of Elites. Now, their income uh, may put them in the top 10% of income earners in the country. Their access to power may put them in a certain elite position. But it is called the House of Commons. Do we no longer see it that way? Well, I think some good points have been made here about, for example, it's called the House of Commons. But when you look at who's representative or who's representing us in the House of Commons and what they look like, it doesn't look like Canada. 
right? So that's one problem. So we have a country that's incredibly diverse and has a lot of people from different experiences and backgrounds, but when we look at our common place, we don't see that. When we uh, think about, for example, walking into the House of Commons, if you just want to participate in your democracy and go watch what happens should you happen to be in Ottawa, you're going to have to pretty much go through an airline search in order oh, to get into the House I of know, Commons. It's really hard nowadays. And, it and, is. and so I think things like that, Queen's Park as well, if you just want to sit in the gallery. You know, I went to the uh, gallery at Queen's Park. You can't tweet in the gallery. You can't applaud in the gallery at Queen's Park. You can barely nod your head in the gallery at Queen's Park. <laughs> and so um, how are we really inviting people to be engaged and make it feel like this place belongs to them? And uh, the, the representation is important too. When people don't see themselves reflected, as has been said, I think they don't feel like it's the House of Commons. They feel like it's the House of Elites. That's a really good point. And, and Don, uh, I, I guess part of the problem is, you know, some people wish ill upon the people who work in those buildings, in Parliament and at Queen's Park. The reason security is the way it is, unfortunately, is that these places have been targets of criminal activities in the past. And anybody who goes into those buildings on a regular occasion regrets the fact that the security is as tight as it is, but what's the alternative? Well, I'm not sure what the alternative is to security, but I, I think, Steve, I would, would like to go back to what you said about the House of Commons, and uh, essentially you started talking about people connecting with their, their member of parliament. Uh, I guess I would ask this question is, if we want people to be engaged, what do, they, what do we think they want to be engaged about? Is it enough for them to actually connect back with their MP or their MPP and have a discussion about immigration? That's important and that's helpful, but my experience is that's probably not a lot for, uh, enough for people to get genuinely engaged in, in politics. Uh, that's a way of solving an administrative problem uh, that they have about getting through the immigration system. I think if we want people at, uh, at large to be much more engaged, they've got to look at the House of Commons and ask themselves, do I see something of myself in here? Not just in terms of the representation, all of that matters, in terms of the issues that are being discussed, the way they're being discussed, and ultimately whether or not that body does anything that's useful to me. Does it come back to me at the end of the day and change my world and somehow uh, in ways that I'm concerned with? And I guess what I would say is more and more, what I hear especially from young people is no, it doesn't. They hmm. feel it's remote, it's detached, and it doesn't connect with their needs. Well, Heather, let me pick that up. I'm going to pick up on that with you because what we have is representative democracy, right? We yes. elect people to go there and make decisions on mm -hmm. our behalf. Maybe that's not good enough anymore. We want to have a much more direct say in democracy. Maybe we want more plebiscites. Maybe we want more online engagement. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think some people want more online engagement, but I think that's a pretty select few. It might, my class in Queens, yes, there's no question. But the, I've also spoken w uh, with people that are less likely to be engaged, less educated people, less not, at, not the Queens audience, and they don't want to make public policy. They want public policy to work for them, and they want public po uh, politicians to talk about things that they care about. And that's where uh, uh, Don's quite right. There's quite a disconnect in the conversation about things that they care about and things that uh, politicians are talking about in, in the House of Commons. A but disconnect. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, I, I mean, I, but I will also say there's a lot of good work that happens in these political institutions, right? And I think our le elected representatives, for the most part, work incredibly hard. And, and, and you know, so we certainly see that here in Ottawa and across the country where we have equal voice chapters. But it's also what gets reported out and, and what uh, sort of has the currency right now in terms of how we talk about politics and, and who politics serves and who is serving politics, if you will. And again, I, I do think, uh, you know, the, the fact that we have this gotcha politics mentality right now, which is really about individual character, which of course is an important part of obviously our political process, but also what is happening in these institutions and the kind of debates and committee meetings and, you know, motions uh, that are being, uh, you know, tabled and, and discussed on, on the floor of our political institutions is really important, and, and, we, and we do lose sight of that. But more importantly, when we think about women and other underrepresented groups and wearing my equal voice hat, we're currently surveying elected uh, women uh, across the country to tell us what they think could change about these political institutions so that in fact they do resonate uh, more meaningfully across their constituencies and what would make it a more livable uh, endeavor for them because I think we can see that uh, politics is really a, a brutal game right now for, for many folks and it doesn't take much to misstep and you just absolutely have to be on your game 100% of the time which you should be but at the same time we don't want, uh, you know, our poli 
politicians to be somehow serving as a disincentive uh, for meaningful engagement with the political process. We need to see, obviously, Canadians feeling excited and engaged. And I would tell you, I agree that, you know, obviously a lot of younger people are disconnected from the political process. But I would also tell you that every day uh, here in Ottawa and in our chapters across the country, we have young women who are incredibly excited to be part of Equal Voice to, to and see the possibilities for our, our political process. And, you know, albeit they're not in the system, they don't necessarily know all the dynamics that are that are at play. But they're very hopeful about what can be accomplished. And I think because politics is a broader forum now and a lot of issues can be made into political issues when you're talking about the environment or you're talking uh, you know about a, a very small issue in your in your community uh, I think that there is a way to make politics incredibly accessible and I have to tell you these wi young women that we interact with every day are really signs and beacons of hope because they're incredibly motivated and they're also inspired to see other women in politics and you know it really matters to them when we host events that feature the voices of women politicians and where they can see that these are real life human beings uh, with with lives outside of the political process who may have families you know who may have a particular history that resonates with them so the opportunities to connect meaningfully with politicians particularly of diverse backgrounds I think does make a difference Desmond let me pick up on that excitement and engagement that Nancy just talked about do younger people in particular feel that that excitement and engagement is impossible because <laughs> we vote for them, they go there, the disconnect takes place, and we feel we've lost any connection after that. Well, the numbers show that a lot of young people aren't voting to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one problem. And I think that the reason that they're not is that, again, they don't see the payoff. They don't feel like there's a genuine sense of engagement and listening. But what there. would a payoff look like? Um, for young people, I think today, uh, youth unemployment is a huge issue for a lot of young people and getting uh, the credentials that they've earned in school recognized. They have huge student debt. You know, they've worked very hard and they want to just try and get some payoff for all of that hard work. And increasingly, I think yeah. that's not, they're not seeing that. So I think that that's one really big thing that would resonate for young people. But there's an authenticity, and I think it's been mentioned already here, that I think is just so d missing. It's absent from our politics. So, you know, uh, you, you, actually do take the time to contact somebody in government and you get a form response back that says thank you very much for your kind uh, submission blah 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 and you know that the person who you wrote to isn't the person that's writing this message back to you uh, you know we know about uh, Kathleen Wynne the Premier of Ontario recently doing that ask me anything activity on Reddit mm -hmm. and people didn't actually feel like it was an ask me anything session because they felt like the questions were very limited the uh, answers were canned I think it felt like to a lot of people People. So where is the genuine engagement? When somebody comes out and really connects and speaks to you, I think that that has a much bigger impact than just being really good at the slick politics and the consistent but very narrow messaging. Nahi, you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I, I think, well, there's, there's two things. I just wanted to pick up uh, on the previous comment about, um, about outreach. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a key problem. I think that one of the reasons people don't engage is they don't know how to. Like, just a straightforward how to. Um, you know, and so education in that sense is really lacking. Um, communities don't know, you know, what's the process of getting, you know, if I have this problem, who's the go-to person or who's, what's the go-to agency or, or, you know, how does that work through the system? That's one. But again, why can't, it's not that controversial to go to an MP's website and they've got all sorts of buttons on that website on how to access what that's you need. That's assuming that you're web literate, people, right? And, that's assuming and how many that people know who their MP is, right? Yeah, like and that's many also people wouldn't know that. And, yeah. and that's also assuming that you have that type of that type of media literacy to kind yeah. of go onto a site like that and be able to navigate it, right? I mean, a lot of us who do this kind of thing for a living spend, you know, all of our waking hours online. It seems almost intuitive, but for a lot of people, it's not, right? And so, I mean, we joke about older people needing to be handheld through Facebook, right. but. I I mean, I mean that's, a, that's a reality for a lot of people. But the second point about, um, about um, wanting to see a, a payoff and wanting to engage, I think that um, for a lot of people, <clears throat> I mean, we often, when we talk about politics in this country, we kind of um, defer to federal politics, right? And I think that people's engagement with various levels of politics, with various levels of government, it changes because they do see the direct payoff, right? And so the engagement with municipal politics is different than the engagement with provincial or federal politics. Closer to home. Closer to home, um, more immediacy, um, you know, you, you know exactly who's responsible for this one thing. But, you know, 
it, it's, I, I think there's also been a bar that's been set for um, a desire for accountability, right? I mean, if you look at just the, the tiny minority of people that are actually online, um, and you want to ask a politician something or you want to get an answer from them, there is that type of engagement happening in small ways. Um, some countries are better at it, some are not so great at it. Um, you know, we saw the example, was it Sweden, that gives the av one, one average citizen on a daily basis runs the government's Twitter feed, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but this is a country of what, two, three million people, right. I, you know. Um, but I think that people have a sense that if we push hard enough, we will get answers. Um, and that's been fed by certain sort of really big media stories, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the going after governments for the things that they're doing. And I think it's set a bar for people. And people are not satisfied with just getting the form response, right? There was a time when that was sufficient. It was sufficient to say, somewhere in the system, my file is there, and I can get, you know, and then I can move it forward. And now people want, maybe rightfully so, they want instant answers. Okay, but Don, we don't live in the day anymore when people used to, for example, get elected to the Ontario legislature and they'd sit for two months a year and then they do their real jobs back in their constituencies, whereas this MPP's job was just sort of giving back. This was something extra you do. Being an MPP is a very full-time job right now. And, and with it comes a, a degree of expertise about how to solve problems and how government works. Is it just simply the fact that we're in a new time where more expert, more managerial class of people have taken over politics and therefore it feels more elitist? Uh, well, I think that is true. But, but I think it's also true that if uh, MPs and others in politics have a kind of expertise, I think there is something that's getting blurred here and it has to do with the payoff. There are different kinds of issues, and I think people intuitively get that, that being engaged on different kinds of issues, we expect different kinds of payoffs. And if we're going to go and see uh, our MPP or someone else uh, and, and to become engaged or hope they will help us get involved in the process, I think they need to be able to recognize what we're looking for better and help us find it. Let me just give you an example. Sure. I think the idea that somebody talked about municipal governance is a very good example. People will get really upset or really engaged over their pets. Pets matter to them. Parks matter to them. Mm -hmm. And if it's about pets, they might go out to a local meeting, and if they see some immediate turnaround in uh, pet licensing or uh, off-leash parks or whatever it may be, they feel like they're getting some kind of response. You're not going to get that on a lot of the bigger issues like climate change or something the federal government or the Ontario government might deal with. And I think there is a question. We need to sort out what kinds of engagement uh, do we want to have for different kinds of issues that people are, we want them to be involved in. It's not just a question of showing up at a town hall and saying something. If I show up at a town hall on, on uh, parks or on uh, pets off-leash off, off parks, I might well have an impact that I see tomorrow. If I show up at a town hall on climate change, it probably disappears the day after I leave, and I wonder why did I do that uh, and whatever came of it. There are different ways of thinking about how we should involve people in issues and different ways of giving them payoffs, and I think if uh, what MPPs and others in politics really ought to be thinking about is how do we make these different, distinguish, these different distinctions and how do we engage people in a way that actually gives them a sense that their participation makes a difference. But Heather, what's changed? What's changed? Because back in the 1980s, there were thousands of people that would gather in the streets, for example, of Toronto to protest Ronald Reagan's decision to try to deploy a new class of missile, nuclear missile, in Europe. Now, those people couldn't possibly have had one iota of influence on Ronald Reagan's decision, and yet they were out there in big numbers. Whereas today, <laughs> That never happens anymore. Well, I think uh, they, there was a, that issue in particular, there was a threat or they saw a threat. So people will take to the streets if there's a threat. And there are people taking to the str streets. Uh, there has been an Idle No More movement in this country. There has been a student protest, uh, the Maple Spring. So nothing has necessarily changed if there's an issue they care about. But I, I do think the listening, the disconnect, but the, the manage, what they see is managerial politics and listening are two different things. Um, so you're, uh, there are two different roles there. And uh, I think Don's right on that we need to have a dialogue about how to connect and how to listen better or how to signal that they do listen better. Yeah, I, 
If I may, I think also that the issue of local politics versus the maybe provincial or federal stuff is a really important distinction. I spend a lot of time at City Hall and I observe a lot of what goes on down there. And one thing I love about the city is that you can walk in without going through a metal detector. You can see your representative in the hallway and say, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about an issue for a second and they'll stop and talk to you. There's a lot more access. You feel a lot closer to the process of what's happening. But I also want to say that even if you're talking about the local level, you still have to be invited to participate. The idea that we should assume that people are just going to go find these ways of getting involved, that's, that's that's a big problem. You know, we had a city budget that was very contentious that we just went through in Toronto. Do you know how many councillors, Steve, didn't even host a budget consultation meeting in their community? How many to say, did not do it? I'd say more than half of them didn't do it. <laughs> They didn't invite the community to come out and say this is the one time of year where we set priorities and you're invited to come and tell us what yours are. They didn't do it. And so do we expect that uh, if, if they don't do it, then it's up to the constituents to go and find them and hunt them down and call them and email them? <laughs> or shouldn't they be finding more ways to get to us? Where's the reciprocation? Well, as long as you're talking about Ontario's capital city, let's, let's explore that a little bit because perhaps the best example of uh, the revenge of the anti-elites took place about three and a half years ago when Rob Ford, running on a very populist, very anti-elitist campaign, uh, came out of nowhere and became the mayor of the city. Um, are we at the point, Don, let me start with you on this. Are we at the point now where all you've got to, maybe not all you've got to do, but a big way to get elected nowadays is just say, I'm with the people. I'm not an elitist. And that's enough. <laughs> Uh, no, I'd, I'd actually say you've got to say one more thing, and that's that you've got to say I'm going to cut your taxes. <laughs> uh, it, it, seems, it seems to me that uh, I, I, uh, I think this is a really serious uh, concern. Uh, and I guess if I could return to some of the things we said earlier, I do think it goes back to the payoff thing. Whether the payoff is big policies in climate change or it's small things in dog parks, the bottom line is people will believe in governments and they'll have confidence in them if, in fact, when they're involved, they see some result from it. And I think the genuine, the general view is increasingly we don't. And if that's the case, and the more that governments promise big things but fail to deliver it, or small things and fail to deliver them, uh, the more people are inclined to say, I'll take whatever I can get. And when somebody comes up to you and says, look, you know what, uh, all this big talk and all these big promises are just elites saying what they say. Uh, the reality is they're taking your money and doing all sorts of stuff with it. So why don't we just cut your taxes? Why don't we be reasonable about government and realize that uh, the good old days when it was relatively small and not in your face were better ways of governing? And let's go back to that. People shrug. And it's not that they necessarily don't want other things. It's that increasingly they don't believe they're going to get them. So they'll take what they think they might get. Nancy? Well, I just want to return to a point, too. I mean, research out of the states shows that people become political. Their, their ideas about the political process form very early. And we're talking around the dinner table when kids are literally in elementary school. And there's some very credible findings out of the U.S. that show if you're not having those dinner table conversations about what an elected member is, what politics is, why it matters, why you care as, as a family, um, then then a lot of uh, individuals who wouldn't necessarily gravitate towards a political process or don't see them reflected in it aren't going to develop that kind of ownership. And that ownership actually starts far earlier than we think it does. So while I totally agree with Don and others regarding issues, the reality is, is even with municipal councils that are far more accessible, the numbers are no different for women. And when we look at 16% of Canada's mayors only being female, and you look at those comp the composition generally of those municipal councils, they're not that much uh, different than, I think, uh, what we see across the country. I think there, there tends to be some more diversity, but it's not that uh, notable. Okay, but so I want to get back think, to Ford yeah. Nation here. I want to... <laughs> You wrote about this in, in The Atlantic, the, the Ford phenomenon. I mean, this was a guy who literally came out of nowhere to say, I'm a man of the people. All these elites are trying to screw you. Vote for me. And it worked. What did you find about that? Well, it, it, worked, uh, it worked with a caveat. Um, what was voter turnout? Right? Um, I mean, voter turnout, so he got less than half of just over half the vote. Um, so it's not but like that's he typical. was. That's the well, way it's, it's been for it's years. Typical, but I'm but I'm saying that um, you know, for for Rob Ford, a, a low voter turnout was a blessing. I mean, that was that was part of what brought him into this, and so that's just that's just one side of it. But I think that if you look at the communities that he did resonate with. Um, that a lot of those communities are communities that feel marginalized, and it's exactly as yeah, and, and it's exactly as Don said that yeah. if you don't feel you're part of the process, 
um, and you're not really, and you don't feel welcome to participate in the process. And then there's somebody standing on your lawn saying, at the very least, I'm going to cut your taxes and I'm going to stop the gravy train and all of these other elite guys, which is not me, even though I'm rich as heck, um, but all of these other elite guys, you know, I'm going to bring them down a peg or two. And it's a message that resonates with people who feel like they're outside of the system. Yes. And so it's, it's not even about, but it's not even about delivering on promises, right? Because he didn't deliver on the promises, exactly. right? It's about the perception of delivery. Um, and I think that when you have very little, then even perception can be a big thing. Heather. It's a little more than that too though. It's about whether the conversation includes them or not. And uh, it, prior to all of the things that are currently happening with Rob Ford, uh, he came at a point in time where they weren't, if you weren't on the subway line in Toronto, you weren't talked about. You weren't important. Mm -hmm. And they got that. People get that. And so when someone says, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the things that you care about, Steve. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to deliver for you. Who are you going to vote for? You, 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 I, if I infer properly here, you're yeah. talking about the people who live in the inner suburbs yeah, as yeah. opposed to for sure. the downtown left-leaning, white you, wine sipping, you subway your, riding. You and your two Lock degrees. Coles. <laughs> you and your two degrees. Um, yeah. uh, enough talk about you. Let's talk about me for a while. Right. And it's not a. It's. Uh, not a bad thing. Yeah, you follow this carefully, obviously. Uh, I, I'm chomping at the bit here. So, for, yeah. <laughs> just for the record, I'm a whiskey guy, not a white wine guy. But, uh, no, I, I think two things here on this. I, I think that he just absolutely nailed it. Um, Mayor Ford is about perception. Mayor Ford is as elite as it comes. Let's not forget, okay? He's the son of a multi-millionaire businessman. He, politician. Politician, right? Okay. MVP. He right. got an Escalade for his birthday from his bro. You know, this is not a man of the people. He rode the subway probably for the first time in his term after he lost a huge vote on subways. Mayor Ford is not a common man. He's not a man of the people. He likes to play that game in order to talk to people and in order to connect with them. But I don't actually think that there's any, um, uh, you know, it, uh, kind of... Uh, illusion even on the part of his supporters because what he's doing is he's coming down from on high as an elite and saying you see this system forget about this system just talk to your your brother here i've got it for you i'm going to help you but out Devin, and you don't need that system. let me push back a little bit yeah. on this because rob ford may have some of the attributes of an elite he he is the son of a multi-millionaire uh, and all of the other things that you've referred to but he didn't go to finishing school. That's right. He never went to Upper Canada yeah. College. Right. He is, in, in a very real, authentic way, one of the boys. Yeah. And He's so, a real man of the people. So You've got to give him that. No, I do. But I think what that tells us is that uh, people feel uncomfortable with the way that politics works, and they feel disconnected from it. And so if somebody sounds uh, that they're not from that culture, if somebody talks and acts in a way that maybe says that I'm an outsider, that again, that's enough for people. You don't actually have to deliver on anything, but it, at least you're making people feel a little more comforted that this big, huge, elitist system is not completely out of reach and that somebody in there understands where they're coming from. They don't have to deliver. But that's an interesting point. Sorry to cut you off, Can but the, the idea that elitism isn't always about wealth right? Elitism is about recognizing the same things. And I know this is a totally off the, you know, off the topic point. But just to, okay. So, so years ago, everybody remembers when Oprah lost like a ton of weight, right? Um, and so she <laughs> basically, she, she did a whole show on the fact that she received tons of mail from her viewers who said to her that I never felt different from you, despite the fact that you're like a multi, multi-millionaire, but now I feel distanced from you because you're a lot thinner than you used to be. Hmm. Right. And so it was it was that perception that she had an issue that was like my issue and that all of her money despite all of her money it's helped me to see myself as part of who she was and, and part of the same system and that's right? Ford right there and that's it? Ford right there that it's not about the money it's not about I mean, he doesn't live in a giant home. He doesn't wear fancy clothes. He doesn't, well, relatively speaking, he doesn't, he doesn't have these fancy vacations in places. He doesn't, he doesn't sort of culture drop in a way mm -hmm. that f makes the average person feel distant from him. I live in the suburbs. I live just outside of Toronto and I work in the city. And I joke around with colleagues all the time that half the time when you all living in the downtown core are talking about your weekends, I don't understand half your references, like where you're going, <laughs> 
seeing where you're hanging out because I don't live there and it's it's just it's more of a joke I mean I don't feel disconnected from them in that way but can you imagine if as a consumer of of media and as as someone who's looking to leadership people are socializing interacting and living in a way that you don't recognize mm. it's very it's very off-putting. Don you wanted in. Yeah, I, I think the plain talk thing and the authenticity, that there's something really important there. Not only because in some ways Rob Ford is authentic and he is a plain talker, whether or not he's elite in other ways, it contrasts so strongly with the way that uh, that the elite side of politics is. When they talk to us uh, or when, uh, when the elites in politics talk to us, when the parties talk to us, it's through talking points, it's through communications uh, programs, it's through all kinds of spin. And I think most people are at the point where they know uh, that junk is junk. They know when they're being mm -hmm. spoken to and they know when they're not. And I guess to Rod Ford's credit, at some level, he connects with people on a level they feel resonates with him and that he's really speaking to them. Whether or not at the end of the day uh, the things he delivers on are more perception or real is another question. But he does connect with them and certainly that contrasts with the elite nature of most politics mm -hmm. today. Heather, but it does. Also, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. I think there's a public-private contrast, right, where people have these public personas and they're very polished. And obviously, with Rob Ford, what you see, what, you don't get that, right? Like he really seems to present as he is, uh, and and that divide between public and and private doesn't really seem to, to hold for him. And I think. It is almost very relieving for a lot of people to sort of see him do what he does because there don't appear to be the same kind of filters in uh, much of how he behaves. I'm not sure it's true for, <laughs> excuse me, all of how he behaves. But the whole authenticity question and, and the fact that we're talking about men of the people, right, um, still suggests that we are uh, in the throes of, of a culture that is still very much about the old boys club. And you get these political figures, men or women, who kind of come up against that in a very particular way and contrast themselves against it. And sometimes it really works and sometimes it doesn't. But I really think the conversation we want to have is how do we break open that old boys club, right? How do you kind of turn it on its head so that you're not thinking around about a club and you're not thinking just about the old boys who serve in the club or, or the outlier guy who, who doesn't quite act in the same way that we would expect of our political class but how do you break it open and I would say and I know we're talking about on Toronto and Ontario but if you look at the Federal House of Commons right now it is actually slightly more diverse we have more young women particularly from Quebec serving in the house than we've ever had and you know it is it is evolving with time but it's gonna take I think a really concerted conversation and effort to say we want to break this thing open so okay that but there Nancy, isn't that Nancy gap. hang on yeah. we, we, we I mean we, a couple of months ago, 85% of Canadians lived in provinces that were led by female premiers. Yeah. So it, it has the old boys yeah, club not been shattered already? I uh, know. No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, you can look in St. John's and uh, we would salute, Equal Voice salutes and have celebrated uh, uh, like thoroughly the success of those female premiers. But you look in Newfoundland and Labrador, where I, I come from, and Kathy Dunderdale served in a legislature with only 17% women. It actually went down during her tenure not up and subsequent or just before she uh, stepped down as premier in fact uh, the municipal elections in Newfoundland produced a, a capital city St. John's with zero women serving so the reality is is we've had these breakthrough breakthroughs from very seasoned women who've been part of the political process and we we salute those breakthroughs but they're tenuous Steve and I think everyone around the panel would recognize that while they were excellent uh, historical moments can we sustain them and I think the institutional changes we're trying to seek and that I think we're all very preoccupied around this table ha go far beyond these symbolic uh, successes that don't hold and I think they don't hold because the institutions themselves aren't as reflective as, um, as as people want them to be. Okay, let me pick up on that then. And Heather, let me try this. Everybody remembers John Kennedy's inaugural address. Ask not, yes. you know, what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. <clears throat> Are we at the point now where our relationship and our disconnect with our democratic institutions is so profound that I think, as you put it earlier in the program, all we ask about nowadays is, what's in it for me? 
I don't think actually I have I don't have that negative a view of politics. I think actually it's quite the opposite. I think that and particularly those under 30 are actually looking for that big picture. They're looking for Absolutely. the Kennedy and if they don't have a Kennedy they're going to vote for a Ford. And it's <laughs> not a good choice to make but uh, as far as uh, where are the conversations, where are the noble uh, conversations about what Canada is going to be? I don't see a lot of that and I think if those conversations were there people would also come so it's not just and I think Don was talking about uh, how we engage them we also should engage them on on bigger picture what is Canada what's the dr Canadian dream because we stopped having that conversation we've stopped having the conversation about the nature of the Canadian dream yes because we're talking about issues and we're segmenting populations and we're seg uh, 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 shopping for votes instead hmm. and how do I bring like out a Susan particular Delacroix's vote book. yes yeah oh. Yeah, yeah, good book. But it's also the character. Of, we, we talk a lot about the character of the individuals who are serving, and less about the institutions and what those institutions are doing. And I, and you know, I think it's important to talk about people's characters. No question. I think it's valuable. But it's sort of like we we're we're stuck in that place, and we have to get beyond it. And I think, you know, obviously some institutional reforms uh, that would open, uh, you know, these spaces up. And I do think, you know, the kind of um, work that non-governmental organizations do to bring people into those political institutions and to really humanize politics and, and to make it a more tangible and accessible arena for them is important. And I would say, just closing here, that what we when we hear from women who want to run, uh, they are highly motivated by the issues. They are motivated because something in their community or some experience that they've yeah. had... As opposed to such, they want power or they want their name in the paper. It's issue-driven. Right. So I do think Canadians care about the issues deeply, but it's how you translate that deep sentiment and caring for issues to political institutions that are still, you know, in many respects, just simply quite outdated and are not serving Canadians in the way that we need them to. Nahid, how about in your experience? Have we lost this, ask not what your country can do for you? Um, I think we have. I think that there was a time in this country where government was in the, also played the role of sort of nurturing citizenship, right? This, this idea of what it meant to be a Canadian and what it meant to actually live those ideals. Um, as citizens. And we don't have that conversation about citizenship anymore, really. I mean, what it is is really about the responsibilities of citizenship. Um, and, it, and it's something that I think is reflective also of this move away um, to, to, and, and move toward a sort of a very managerial politics, right? Government as manager. And so citizens as workers, um, as good responsible corporate entities, as good taxpayers, but not really about talking um, about what those ideals are, what those larger ideals are. And and that's how that, I think, is it's really translated into this crisis in, in terms of the institutions. It's become very patronage-based. Um, it's become very ideological. Well, let's get and some ideas on the table here because, uh, all right, we understand that if you try to go to Queen's Park, as you pointed out earlier, and you want to watch the proceedings there, they're going to pretty much strip search it before they let you in the front door. It's gotten really, it's really ridiculous now. It's, you talk about not uh, putting out the welcome mat to citizens. I agree with you 110 percent. But... Uh, what can we do? Don, get us started here. What can we do to make, to make a better reconnection and make democracy seem less elitist and more accessible to Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Canada? Go ahead. Uh, well, I guess I would say this. First of all, there, a number of ideas have come up, and I think it is important that there's better gender balance and, uh, and uh, ethnic balance and other things like that, visible uh, recognition. But I think it's got to go way beyond that. I would go back to some of the basic things people care about. Uh, if, if, the poli if politics is supposed to be issues driven and people are supposed to be getting engaged on issues they care about, I think at the end of the day they have to see some kind of result from it. And I, I guess I would say this is that on issues that matter to people, we need ways of engaging them that uh, somebody mentioned ownership that genuinely give them not only a sense of ownership of the issue, but a sense of responsibility that they actually have a role to play in solving that issue and that challenges them to get involved not only in terms of their voice but in terms of their action. So more plebiscites? And if it's as simple as... More plebiscites? Uh, no, no, no. I would say uh, take for example something as simple as climate change. It's uh, it, not I should say simple but an issue like climate change. It's not enough to say I'm opposed to it, right? I don't uh, and to expect government to resolve the problem. Uh, part of what I would want to do is at some level whether it's municipal, provincial or federal is challenge people and say all right we're, our job as government is to develop and mobilize people around various strategies. How do we engage this community 
and what exactly are you going to do in order to contribute to this outcome and how are you going to take some ownership and you get a voice in that you get to say something about how this should be resolved but the price you pay for that is ultimately you've got to do something whether it's turning your thermostat down or some other thing and I think what we don't do is politicians don't engage us in ways that uh, that that demand that we actually perform in some way uh, in exchange for the voice we're giving so I'd be in favor of something that says we need a better bargain but the bargain isn't just that you get to tell us what to do in the House of Commons the, gar the bargain is we're going to have a discussion and at the end of the day when we decide what we're going to do uh, you're going to have something to do as a community or an organization or an individual and ultimately you have to take some ownership and responsibility and that the return you see on that is people mobilizing around issues that will make more uh, make more gains on them and get better results and people will see genuine progress. Gotcha. I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but I think that's ultimately where we have to go. That's a place to start. Desmond, one idea, getting people re-engaged in their democracy. Wow, there are so many. Um, <laughs> I think one thing that you can do is, I think I, I really agree with Don, is that you have to kind of engage people and uh, rather than saying, now that I'm in charge, you don't have to worry about anything because I'm going to do it all for you, that we're going to do this together. So I'm actually going to uh, come into your neighborhood and I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to talk with you and I'm going to host public meetings. Or, you know, Instead of talking, you know, we had uh, tens of thousands of trees just destroyed in the city of Toronto, right? Uh, because of the ice storm that happened. Oh, what if we had an initiative where people were actually replanting trees in their communities rather than just being like, oh, some trees fell down. I'm really angry that the government... Can I, can I give you the cynical response? Yeah, please. Uh, the, uh, city work, <laughs> the, the unionized city workers yeah. would freak out. That's why you can't do that. Yeah. They'd say you're taking away our work. I think you could get beyond that. I really do. Me, me, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> oh, me, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I, I'm. For, to be fair, I'm speaking off the top of my head here, but what I'm saying is that this managerial approach, where we say there's a problem to be solved. I've identified who needs to solve the problem. Now I'm looking at my watch, being angry. It's been five hours, and the problem is not being solved. Yes. Many hands make light work, Steve. We have to talk about community, right? And we have to get away from this idea that we make demands on government and then we time them to see how quickly that they can perform. Uh, we want to get people's hands into the game and make them feel happy and excited that they were part of the solution. Because ultimately, uh, getting re-engaged and feeling like, hey, you know, we actually got a win. We did something together. That's what's going to keep people coming back to the political process. Heather. Listening and delivering. Who listens, who delivers? Both. Politicians listen and deliver. Politicians listen to their constituents. They deliver yes. for their constituents. It's that simple. It is that simple. Just let them listen. How? What? How listen? That, now that I think is a, a larger challenge is how do you get to people that haven't, that aren't engaged now and how do you listen? But I think that, and one of the uh, simple things that we've lost in this Twitter uh, verse is door knocking, community uh, town halls. Mm -hmm. This is something that we haven't quite made up for yet. And the first person that finds a way to do that, Ned Nenshi, part of his success in that campaign was going uh, to uh, high schools and talking to kids. And actually not just talking, not talking at them, talking to them and listening to them. Mm. Listening, and then, but I don't agree with it. It's just promise and, and it's okay that they don't deliver. They had better deliver because the, what's the point? Um, I think it's even more fundamental than that. I think it's, it's, it's uh, trying to have a conversation about what citizenship looks like. Um, and it looks like something different depending on where you're coming from uh, in terms of your race, in terms of your class, in terms of your urban rural, in terms of your geography. And I don't think that we as, um, as a country have really had those conversations in a really long time. And I think it starts at a very young, uh, at a very young age. I think it starts with curriculum in public schools. I think it starts with, um, you know, we've got these sort of heavily ideological booklets for new Canadians that are, you know, this is unacceptable and this is unacceptable and it, that doesn't really help and I think that it's also partly the way politicians speak I think that there's a there's, a, there's sort of a, a political speak um, which is very divorced from how people engage with one another yeah, it's because they're media trained well they're media trained and, and yeah and I think that and I think better reporting I think the media doesn't really do a very good job in um, in talking politics in this country because it's always capital P politics right <laughs> it's never small P politics um, but I think fundamentally it's an issue of talking about what does citizenship look like to, to the citizens of the 
this country. Nancy Peckford, you get the last word. <laughs> well, certainly we believe that equipping more women and underrepresented groups to run and win is absolutely fundamental so that we can make those more structural changes and ensure that the institutions actually look like the people they serve. And I think with time, that will make a meaningful difference, but it takes time, it takes resources, it takes investment, and it takes all of us talking about the political process in a way that's hopeful and, and encouraging for, for everybody who's, who's watching, either uh, from afar or quite closely. Nancy, do you not feel somewhat uh, depressed when you consider how little progress has been made in all of the years you've been at this? No, I actually don't. I mean, I, I think we've had a conversation about the limitations of the current political systems, but we're in the process of talking to elected women from across the country about their experience in politics and what they think the structural uh, issues are and how they can be changed, whether it be the use of technology, shorter legislative sessions, more support for constituency work that a lot of people spend a ton of time on. Um, and we will be issuing a report later this year to look systematically at what those changes are. But moreover, we're really encouraged by the kind of people we interact with, young women, uh, midlife women who are interested in making that contribution to the political process. And I can assure you, they are not all of one class, one race, one background. We have women from all backgrounds and walks of life wanting to take ownership in the political system. And I see it every day and I live it and we are working very hard at Equal Voice to respond to them. And that's what gives me hope. And Steve, I'll never give up hope. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> I know that to be true. Okay. We want to thank everybody for joining us for tonight's discussion. Don Lenahan from the Public Policy Forum in the nation's capital. Uh, the indefatigable Nancy Peckford <laughs> from <laughs> the Executive Director of Equal Voice also in the nation's capital. Thank you. Not Nahid Mustafa, the freelance journalist. You can read more about these issues in last November's Atlantic, in which she wrote. Heather Bastido from Queen's University and Desmond Cole from City Vote. Good stuff, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.